Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us. We are here tonight from the Ann Arbor District Library to discuss the NRA's book club's um, June pick. The name of the book is The Night Tiger, and this is by Yang Shi Chu. And before we get started, um, let's just introduce ourselves and give a brief visual description if you're comfortable with that. So I'll start. My name is Lucy. I'm a library tech here at the library. I do a lot of youth programming, but I also do programming for adults, and I really enjoy discussing books. Uh, I am a 52-year-old white woman with glasses. I have shoulder-length brown hair. I'm wearing a red shirt and I have uh, some books behind me and a tattoo of an isopod on my shoulder. I'm Emily. I am a librarian at AADL. I am a white woman in my mid-30s. I have uh, curly reddish hair that's up in a shoulder-length ponytail. I'm wearing a polka dot green top and I'm sitting in front of a mostly white wall with a print of Matisse. Hi, I'm Anne. I am a book processor, primarily out of the Westgate branch, and I am a 46-year-old white woman, uh, shoulder-length brown hair, glasses, and I'm wearing a black striped shirt in front of a uh, wall of white doors. Hello, I'm Beth. I am... Um on the outreach team of the ADL. And I am a 62 year old white woman with hair that's always does whatever it wants, it's kind of humid. Um, it's dark, mostly. I'm wearing glasses, I'm wearing a black top and behind me are some plants and uh, some art on the wall. Um. Great. So I guess to start off, I wonder if it, does anyone want to give um, a brief description of The Night Tiger, just so folks know what we are talking about? It's a hard book to explain. So it I'll is. start, yeah. but mm -hmm. if folks want to jump in, especially I read this over a long period of time, so yep. I think I will very easily forget some some plots. I don't even know what genre to call it. It's sort of historical, sort of fantasy, sort of his magical realism. Uh, but our two protagonists are um, Ren, who is a young boy who works for uh, a couple of different doctors uh, and has been tasked after the death of his, the first doctor he worked for, um, who had lost a finger and it was missing. Ren was given the task of finding this missing finger within, I believe it's 50 days so that it can be reunited and buried with his, um, that first doctor. Um, and so you see him as he goes along that, that path and is also figuring out his role in the how, new household he's in. And then our other protagonist is Ji Ling, Ji Lin, who is um, a young woman who is working a few different jobs to uh, help with her mother's mahjong debts and uh, kind of trying to figure out who she is in the world as well. So she uh, works both for a, um, I believe, a seamstress or a dressmaker. And she also works, uh, unbeknownst to anyone who knows her personally, as a dance hall girl. Uh, and this is how their two stories end up eventually intertwining, because when uh, Jilin is dancing with a, a salesman. Uh, somehow he slips her a vial that has this missing finger. And so she is trying to figure out what on earth to do with this mummified finger and trying to reunite it with Ren. That's the real quick overview of what gets them started on their journeys. But there are um, lots of bits of culture of figuring out uh, for both both of them, figuring out who they want to be in the world. There's some magical realism with the potential existence of where tigers, women in the city are um, getting uh, eaten or mauled by tigers. And uh, it, people are worried and scared about that. And um, a whole lot more about death and the in-between stage of what happens after you die, but perhaps before you uh, find ultimate rest i missed a whole lot so anyone else chime in well oh. i just was going to add that it was in the early 30s right 
Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Yeah, so that also, I found that very fascinating, just the whole, you know, cultural aspect of life in Malaysia and Mm -hmm. um, the colonization and just what it, what it was, you know, what the vibe was. I thought that was, but, um, but I think you were spot on and yeah, it's a very hard book to, to, um, talk about, but, and initially I didn't really, I was like finger, ew. And that, but I really did enjoy the book. I, once I got into it, I, I really did. I really liked, uh, the characters. Yeah. I think that, um, it what's interesting about like Malaysia as well, or, um, Malaya at this time is like all the blending of cultures that we get in the book. So there was a lot about that um, as well that I found very interesting. I also would like to throw into the genre mix, maybe. I mean, there is romance. That, so it's kind of like a weird, like you were saying, Emily, it's hard to typify because it's it is kind of a weird blend. And I did think that there were sometimes like things that would come up and you were waiting. You're like, when am I going to see that again? And then I felt almost like we moved to it in a different direction. So um, it had a lot, a lot going on. um, It also was a mystery. Um, Yes. You know, on top of everything else, because you're trying to figure out, are there tigers doing this? Is it just something that people like, are these deaths something that people are kind of willing into being just by thinking about it because they're, you know, ability to kind of shape things around them are so strong or is it something outside um that we aren't even paying attention to that's doing it i don't know i i personally really enjoyed this book and um for me it it was when the finger came out that i just was grabbed and was like that wasn't where i thought we were going with this at all um but yeah i really i enjoyed the um the interconnectedness of characters that didn't necessarily know each other uh and one of the ways that the author brought the the characters together was through them being named after the five virtues um so the two main characters ren and g were uh ren is humanity or human heartedness uh G is knowledge. And then her twin brother, um, Shin, is integrity. And, uh, well, her twin stepbrother, we should make that very, they are not biologically related. They were just born on the same day. Um, And then Yi is uh, Ren's twin brother who passed away several years ago um, when he was seven or eight. uh, And Yi stands for righteousness. Um, And then the fifth one, which you spend a lot of the book trying to figure out who they are, uh, is Lee, which is for ritual or the order of things um, and how they happen. And I just really liked how those characteristics you could see in um, in the characters. Yeah, I also thought with with those five, um, like pillars of from confucianism or whatever that seeing the um where they showed up in the characters was also like reflected you could also see where they where the characters were were acting against or being almost opposite of what they were exposed you know supposed to be or not supposed to be but what their virtue was and i i think that that like that kind of ran throughout the book this idea that every all of them had something in them that was some one of them. I think Yi or Ren says that at one point that like each one of the virtues has something dark in them or something that will, um, you know, go against what what their virtue is. And so I think it helps to like lend complexity to all the characters and like make it so they weren't just like this following this one yeah. virtuous path. It also made me wonder like where where's this darkness going to show up? You know. There was the discussion, too, of how it's not like these five virtues and you should choose one and go for it. Like they're intended in um, Confucian, Confucianism, the Confucianism. That's right. Right. Um, uh, it's 
the five virtues within a person. And so the characters tend to kind of lean towards whatever their thing is, and it throws everything else out of whack because they're not inhabiting all of the virtues. Um, I did find it interesting, though, that as it went, I feel like it kind of dropped off a little bit towards the very end, like the the connection between them with with that. I don't know. There was a lot going on in the end, you know, with there was. Yeah, lot, lots of moving parts. But what I thought was really cool was the very end that kind of lent itself to the potential of another book to me with them both going to uh, Singapore, right? Isn't that where they were ended up? Mm -hmm. um, I don't know what that would mean or what what it would, but I did, I I liked Jilin a lot. I liked her, I liked her, um, the her tenaciousness and um, she was very different. You know, just even the way she wore her hair was really unusual because it was mm -hmm. short. And people commented on that because, yeah, it was really, I mean, in the 30s. Um, so anyway, I was just throwing that out. I liked it. It's a really unique experience for me reading this book. And I say reading. I, I listened to the audio book of this. It's read by the author. Um, and sometimes when audiobooks are read by the authors, you think, oh, you, you insisted on doing this, didn't you? You're not very good at it. This author did a, did a nice job with it. Um, but it was one of those things that I always enjoyed it while I was listening, but I didn't feel that compulsion to keep going that I often do with books. Um, and I think part of it was that there was so much going on. Um, and then as the book went on, while I was more interested in the mystery and kind of figuring out who this fifth person was, um, I'm going to stop talking around what we were talking about. The somewhat incestuous um, storyline between the the romance between the the stepbrother and se stepsister really, really turned me off. Um, it felt out of character, and I kept expecting it to quickly be a plot point where it was, this is ridiculous. I can't believe that he's acting this way. And, and instead it turned into a, well, I guess this, this might be acceptable. Um, and I think that prevented me from really enjoying the last third of the book because I kept, it just gave me that real ick feeling and it just kept coming back up. Um, and it made me think a lot about how I may have had a different perspective of it if I read this book when I was younger, um, when just the idea of romance was more interesting. And that also gave me an ick feeling because I don't like what what it says about the the sibling relationship that step siblings can have i felt like it actually kind of undercut the the fact that you can have a sibling relationship with someone who you may not be blood related to yeah i i agree with that i think um because in the beginning they talked so much she talked about you know her twin connection to him and and how um when you know their families blended and he was like supportive of her until he moved away and they did have a very it seemed like very much of a sibling relationship i think i mean they do talk about the fact that they're not related and but i think you're right emily in that it's like what does that say about the strength of their relationship as step siblings and twins and then also i have to say i found shin to be really kind of creepy in the in this relationship, in the way that he would just push and push and push. And sometimes she said no, and he kept going. And he talked constantly about seducing her, like, I will seduce you. And I, um, so yeah, again, like if I'd read it in a different time in my life, I don't know, would that have stuck out? And, and then is that, you know, so I think I had the same experience that you did, Emily, where I was like, why, why is this happening? So um, that was a little bit, I would have liked if it had been more of just the mystery and the the magical realism. I I had to, I had to 
like self-talk that, and what I, I said was, okay, they were apart for 10 years, right? Isn't that what, you know, they were apart, but so that was where I was trying to justify, but it, it, it so it became less creepy for me, but it was still like, yeah, when it was, it was a little, yeah, it was still, it was still a bit creepy, but, but then she wasn't, I don't feel like, like it, she could, it could have ended where she was like glomming onto him and that's not right. I mean, she decided to go do what she needed to do. Um, the door was p potentially open, but, but yeah, she, that's right. And then she was going to go to school. So, um, yeah, I liked that aspect of her personality, but he, yeah, he reminded me of yeah. some people. <laughs> well, and even though he had gone away for 10 years and that kind of changed their dynamic, he went away because he was having feelings for her and his dad said, uh-uh. You need to <laughs> you need to leave. You need to not interact with her. And uh, then that led to him disappearing. But I didn't have quite the yuck factor, but it definitely. I was more OK with it until it actually happened. And then that's when I really saw Shin's controlling and weird, obsessive side of it. and. That took it from it being this like really close bond that in some ways is in some ways is mimicked in the Ren Yi, um, just like the the interconnectedness, even though they weren't twins, it was like they had this very strong connection, um, but it became very lopsided. Yeah, you know, and in thinking about it also for, um, it's not like she had as many choices, you know, like part of the reason she was working in the dance hall was because that was something that she could do to make money. She had to get her mother out of debt. She was worried constantly about her mother because her stepfather was horrible and abusive. And her stepfather had said to her, like, if you get married then you can get an education. And she does talk a lot about like I, how unfair it was that Shin got to continue an education and she didn't when they had the same interests and how as a girl, she couldn't do any of that. And so while she decides not to, you know, stay with Shin and marry Shin, I do think that if you, if you look at the whole book, it's like this, this message is constantly in her mind and being pushed on her. Like, get married, get married, get married, get married, be with a man. And so it's probably hard to just, you know, get rid of that or stop thinking that when you're, when you're, when someone that you're close to is then seducing you. So I'm, I'm trying to look at the, the other side of it there. Yeah. It almost felt like grooming, except they were the exact same age. So I <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I agree. Um, so what did everyone think about the, the, the wear tiger part of it? Like, um, I mean, I, I didn't, I'd never heard of a wear tiger. Uh, it's an interesting concept. I didn't know if anyone had any thoughts or, um, I really that. liked how it was handled. Um, mm -hmm. As someone who is not much of a fantasy reader, and oftentimes when, especially when it's not a big part of the plot, when something more magical enters it, sometimes that really turns me off. But I really liked the way it was with the were-tiger, because even as the reader, you were kind of uncertain about, was it or wasn't it? Um, and it wasn't, it almost just, for me, character helped to characterize the community more the way that the community reacted to it um i thought it was really interesting and I, at the at its first mention i thought oh all right oh there's a lot of book left I don't, I don't know that i have this in me and then i thought that the the touches that it came and when it would come back um made sense to me and i was pleasantly surprised with how I reacted to it as someone who often doesn't like those kind of elements. 
the part the part that I was um that was kind of out there uh but but moved the plot along was the fact that they were having the same kind of dream they were both dreaming about the same place and that I've that's always intriguing to me when you know that's used as a plot point um I've seen that before um but it's just kind of like weird like how does that happen but just keep reading and and so it it was you know just a, a way to to move the story along um and i like thinking about that dreams could be shared yeah one something i thought was interesting about the were tiger as opposed to like other I'm not well versed in the world of were creatures, but um, I think that the it seemed unusual to me that the were tiger is not doesn't come across as a tiger. It is instead a, a tiger in a human form, whereas like you think about a werewolf and it's like a man turning into a wolf. So um, I think I liked that that the way that that was used in in the story that you were wondering, you know, who this tiger could be and you kept thinking maybe you knew and then I think it kind of plays into even what you were just saying Beth about like the shared dreams there's this whole thing throughout the whole book of like these two like um either you have a second part of you like a a, a twin or a soul that's connected to you or you could be a tiger and a person so like a man and a beast all in one thing, or you are sharing a dream or you're, you're kind of like being pulled from the living world into the, that train that's almost the dead world. So this is always this like idea of these two things is like reflections or, um, you know, opposites that I, I really liked the way that that was carried through the book in so many different ways. Um, like in pretty much every plot point, it almost seems like there's these kind of two sides to everything. Yeah, the both both the wear tiger and the kind of in between dream place um throughout the whole book it just there was a lot of focus on kind of the spirit versus the body. And they didn't put it in those terms, but that's really what, you know, the the wear tiger that we're experiencing, like maybe one existed at some point, but what we're really dealing with at this point in the story is more of a spiritual wear tiger because it seems to be tied into the finger. Um and once the fingers put to rest things kind of it's like that that character's spirit has been put to rest um and between that and ye not wanting to leave without his brother and you discover that it's not just for like well you think he's interacting to try and save his brother, but he really is wanting his brother because he doesn't want to be alone in the kind of in-between place that he's stayed in. Um, I don't know. There's there's just so much about the kind of transition between life and death and your ability to move on or not move on um, that I just was kind of mesmerized with it. Yeah, it really lent like a um, kind of a haunting feel to it, you know, and and I do think that also makes me think about just the writing in general in in this um, book. It felt very evocative. Like I I felt there were like the descriptions of Malaysia in the 1930s. I just felt like I was getting a lot of like the food that they were eating, um, and the the noises and the places, and then like this sort of I don't know, like misty other world. Um, I could really picture it in my mind. And I think that kind of added to the whole like 
haunted sort of element of it. Yeah, I was I was picturing, um, you know, just the 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 plantations and you know the the areas the the jungly uh, that's how it was described. You know, sort of jungle, rainforesty, um, humidity, heat. Uh, yeah, just and and just what was going on in the world at that time. Just yeah, it's not a not a uh, period I really have read about, and certainly not in that that um, uh, location. Yeah, I watched an uh, interview with the author, and she was saying that she was like initially inspired by seeing these pictures of these kind of like colonial plantation houses in Malaysia that were so huge and, um, you know, like uh, almost palatial and where, where all this happened. And um, the white people had these like, you know, um, lives of, I mean, like they lived, they had parties, they entertained, uh, but these houses now, a lot of them are like in ruin or disrepair. And so seeing that, and I think seeing like the, the pictures of the house when they were constructed and lived in, in the thirties and then what they like now that already is like putting that idea of, um, kind of those two worlds. And, and that was like the, a starting point, I think for her in this book. I will say, I don't know if anyone else listened to any interviews with her or, or she's very funny. She's really funny. Like she's always kind of, um, yeah, she just, she made me laugh. So it was unexpected. Like I didn't get a lot of that in the, the book. So, um, I enjoyed hearing from her. Yeah. I, I must've heard that same interview because, mm -hmm. um, yeah, she was uh, delightful, and yeah, liked chocolate. Just you know, yeah, she keeps talking about chocolate. Have to have chocolate and um, dark chocolate, and uh, yeah, she was also. She made mention of her mother asking about you know her the genre, you know the books mm -hmm. that she's writing, and it's, they're pretty dark, and you know, don't you want to write something that's a little more uplifting? <laughs> um, but yeah, she was. Uh, entertaining to to listen to and i liked her stuff yeah mm -hmm. and i think um sheila and fatima interviewed her i think it's on the unerased book club instagram page so um i haven't watched that but but i will um yeah she seemed i don't know she just yeah she kept talking about chocolate and food in general and um just writing in her pajamas and having total silence and she just was, she was great. And she also was saying, um, Emily, I was thinking about this when you were talking about authors narrating their audio books that she asked to audition to do that because mm -hmm. she felt like there were so many different dialects and languages in this book. And she didn't want to ask someone else to have to try and figure out how to pronounce that correctly. And then she just so, but she didn't make an assumption that she would be the best choice, which I thought was really interesting. Because as you were saying, oftentimes I see, oh, the author narrated it. Hmm. <laughs> you know, she did a really good job. Like I didn't notice that the author was the narrator mm -hmm. initially. Um, and then was kind of surprised when I saw it was her because you you wouldn't assume that it doesn't sound like an amateur job and she has a real musicality in her voice like I really I, I know I have friends who will search out audiobooks based on the narrator uh now I don't know clearly she's she's a writer she's not a narrator but I, I she would be someone who I might seek out again because I I liked listening to her talk and mm -hmm. I also always appreciate when it is read by the author, because then I know that like all the character names are being pronounced how the author intended and all those little details that I don't know how much it really impacts enjoyment of the story as a whole. Uh, but especially when I know we're going to be talking about it later, it, it always mm -hmm. makes me feel a little better to know how how to approach talking about these these characters that I've spent these hours with. 
Mm -hmm. I think I did listen to it at the very beginning and then, <clears throat> excuse me, I placed a hold and it became available. And I just, I just do so much better with a book. Yeah, I do some of both. Like I listened and read and listened and read. And I, th I think you're right. I, I, I wonder if she narrates her other books because that would be a good starting point. Has anyone read anything else by her? I think she had one before this and a new one out now. So it might be. I'm curious to hear or read what her, what something else from her is. Um, because though you nodded Beth that there maybe would be potential for another story um this book doesn't feel like other books I've read and so it's harder for me to think of what would something like this be um and so I would be curious to read something else that she's written to see if it does it have the same feel or not yeah yeah, yeah. I think um, looking her first book I think is about somebody getting married to a ghost a ghost it's called The Ghost Bride. And then her latest one is called The Fox Wife. Um, but I'm not sure what it's about. I think it does have to do with, it takes place in Manchuria and it has to do with um, ghosts. And so I think they're all going to have that, maybe that same feel of the kind of the living world and the, and the non-living world um, colliding. But that's a total guess on my part. Mm -hmm. So don't. Sounds like don't assume would. that that's the truth about this book um very interesting that but i guess she's into ghosts or the other worlds yeah. or the possibilities of it yeah yeah i i liked the i liked experiencing a different concept of death and what happens as you die in that that journey that transition period um because it's not one that i regularly encounter yeah i i i'm always interested in what other cultures do and their beliefs and so i i really liked that aspect of it and just you know the the food and the 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 people I, there was a lot to it uh, that kept me reading <clears throat> toward that. I mean, like, I'd say toward like two thirds in, I was more hooked to it and was looking forward to reading it. Whereas you were a little mm -hmm. creeped out. <clears throat> but that that was like one part of it, though. I mean, I also I, I felt like I kept being surprised. I think mm -hmm. she does a good job of making you pretty sure that you know what's going on and then you're like what well, that's not what's going on um i did think like uh, there's a lot of mention of these oleander bushes in throughout the book i don't know if you noticed this and um the chef in the the house constantly talks about wanting them gone and i the reason i, I thought about it was because i read this book the book white oleander where someone uses them to poison people and i thought that was very much like um you know, I think it's Chekhov's gun, right? Like, I just felt like that's good. That's, that's there for a reason. And so I felt redeemed when that came back yeah. in a significant way. Right, right, right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I noticed that too. And I, I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't remember if I read White Oleander, but I know the story. Um, yeah. So I, I figured it was, it was going to, pop up because mm -hmm. it was on, in there so frequently <clears throat> yeah well and when that first murder happened of Ambika, mm -hmm. Ambika i don't mm -hmm. know how you say your name um they made the the uh pathologist made a bit of a deal out of the fact that the tiger seemingly didn't eat the parts that a tiger normally would eat if they had killed. Um, and he suspected that there was some sort of poisoning or something going on. Right, right. Always yeah. making sure how much I retain of, you know, of books. Like, I, as the more we talk, I was like, oh, yeah, there was that aspect. But I mean, because I'm on to the next book and the next book and the next mm -hmm. book. 
or like what you retain, which details stick out, yeah. you know. Um, yeah. But I do think in a book like this, it, 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 it kind of makes me wonder when I get to the end, I'm like, wait, was this, was this there all along? You know, like I, I it's interesting to go back and think, well, yeah, that, that was set up right there in the beginning. I just wasn't paying attention. So um, there were a lot of moving parts in this book. And I, I, for one, did not, I didn't guess how they were going to finish up. So. No, but I knew that uh, Lydia, there was something with her. I, I, she was suspect. Um, yes, she was. <clears throat> and plus her name was mm -hmm. the other. Yeah. Yeah. One of the, um, and we've kind of briefly touched on it, but um, with G going off to do some nursing school stuff in Singapore, the with her not being able to follow her path and her desire for knowledge because of her place in society, we were seeing the exact same thing with Ren because right off the bat, we saw that as an 11 year old, he is skilled as a caretaker medical assistant um, to the point where he can actually do triage work on his own. Um, but is living in a society where that's not what he's allowed to do because he's an orphan from, well, no family. Um, and seeing both of those characters both shut out from that world, but also welcomed in some ways or acknowledged for their skill at it. Um, I don't know how that ties into anything. I just found it an interesting parallel between them. Yeah, and I think it like was something we didn't really touch up on is is like what makes someone like kind of class and caste and um the socioeconomic aspect of like, you know, what makes Robert appealing is this like he's driving a fancy car and he's gonna, you know, it's just um so being excluded from a world because of your place in it. Um, it it's definitely tied in. And, and then like in this colonial, in this environment, that's like a mixture of Europeans and Malaysians and, um, you know, this colonialist environment. Just occurred to me, that, um, the other thing with um, G working for the, the dressmaker, um, even with her even though she was, you know, at a lower class level, she was able to kind of pass um, in ways that she may not have been able to, you know, in, in certain circumstances. Uh, so, I, and it was, she was very skilled in that area too. So um, anyway, she, she was kind of cosmopolitan. Yeah, I really liked her. I liked, I liked Ren as well, that they were mm -hmm. both great characters. anyone else have anything they want to add about it that we we missed i mean i think there's a lot we could talk about because there's a lot going on but i think we did a pretty good job covering um the gist of it oh one last yeah. thing mm -hmm. i learned what hulu meant uh do you remember it was in the, that you and i forget like upward i think and i it said that you would see hulu in uh at like at the train station for the train I think it did, did mean upward, up, but then it also has a, another meaning. But it was kind like of upstream and downstream. I think down from, yes, yeah. yes, 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 yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Thank and you. And I think beginning and end or start and end were the yeah. third meaning. Yeah. So okay, I guess I didn't learn what Hulu meant, but but its origination. It was like, oh, okay, that I get it now. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Well, the I think next month for the Unraised Book Club, the pick is a 
romance and it is called the duke who didn't and that's by courtney uh milan so it, that should be a fun um summer pick and we'll be back to discuss that uh so if no one else has anything they want to add we'll say thank you for um this discussion it was great